nice. Uh, on very short notice, several hundred of us showed up in Peace Park, and many of you on our staff group that attended that evening. And our message to them was to uh, condemn the tragedy, don't compound it. And that message was not needed by our government, despite our best efforts and the best efforts of many people of conscience who saw the potential for a really tragic cycle of violence uh, to spur out, spiral out of control. And we indeed have seen that over the last nine years. Uh, instead of 3,000, which is terrible and tragic, we've now seen uh, hundreds of times that, many hundreds of thousands, if not over a million people lost their lives because of the wars of 9-11, 2001, and used to justify. So our gathering tonight is to have a remembrance for all we lost, both on 9-11-2001 and in the subsequent wars, and to call for an end to that violence, to call for an end to the hatred and the clash of civilizations that some people are finding profitable to promote, and to, this year particularly, to call for an end to the kind of, uh, oh, rabble-rousing and stirring up hatred that's been happening domestically that we've seen in the last year and a half accelerating. And we have a couple of speakers who are going to be speaking to you addressing these Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am delighted to be with you tonight, both to remember those whose lives were lost, as Mark mentioned, and also to move toward building a world in which we will indeed have no more victims. As I present my views, I trust that each of you is contemplating the truth from your own point of view, and that you will be enriched by your own reflections, and that over time the truth will inspire you and nourish you and set you free. Nine years ago today, as I'm sure most, if not all of us, remember vividly, on Tuesday, September 11, 2001, Two commercial airplanes were hijacked and flown into the World Trade Center in New York City. Soon after, both buildings collapsed. A third plane was crashed into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and a fourth went down in a field in Pennsylvania. As a nation, we continue to mourn, and rightly so. This grief process, the work of lamenting, the work of forgiveness, and the process of healing take a long, long time, and we cannot expect them to go fast. So what have we learned in these ensuing years? One great lesson is that retribution does not work. Retribution does not accomplish justice and does not prepare us in heart and mind for peace. As human beings, our Creator has designed us for a restoration of right relationships. Only restorative justice, in its many and various forms, will lead us to a peaceful tomorrow. The events of 9-11 and the war on terrorism that has ensued remind us of the burden of history. Retribution cannot heal the wounds of violence, but only sow the seeds of further conflict. While 9-11 was used as a call to global war by U.S. leaders, some family members of those killed in the attacks made poignant pleas that violence not be done in their name or in your loved one's name. September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrow's was born. Founded and inspired by the dictum of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. Peaceful Tomorrow's is an organization founded by family members of those killed on September 11, who have united to turn our grief into action for peace by developing and advocating nonviolent options and actions in the pursuit of justice. We hope to break the cycles of violence engendered by the war and terrorism. Myrna made a trip to Afghanistan as a peaceful tomorrow's representative on an interfaith clergy delegation. The group focused on ways to support projects in Afghanistan that were rebuilding schools and clinics and mosques destroyed by U.S. bombing. At home, Myrna continues to work
work on the difficult practices of forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation, striving to be a realistic peacemaker in a world corrupted by <coughs> power and violence. She developed a friendship with the Shiite mosque in her community, where she was invited to speak after she returned from Afghanistan. Now she continues a strong relationship with that mosque, regularly taking her confirmation classes from the United Methodist Church at Red Bank for a Ramadan dinner at the mosque. This is one of the concrete ways that Myrna now practices peacemaking. By expanding the table and bringing together her parishioners with her Shiite friends, she is creating peaceful tomorrows. The group organized the first international gathering of families affected by terrorism and war. It brought together more than 30 individuals from war zones all over the world and, and brought these people together for cooperation, healing, and reconciliation. That is how restorative justice works on a practical level. The best strategy is always preventative, addressing the roots of violence by attending to personal patterns and political structures of injustice. Genuine negotiation requires relative equity across the table and fundamental respect between the parties. If there is a tremendous imbalance in personal or social power between the parties, then negotiation is not an option. The United Nations Blue Helmet Forces represent a noble experiment in transnational policing. However, when such efforts as the UN peacekeepers become compromised by powerful countries such as ours, that other agencies must provide alternatives to call the warring factions into accountability. Examples of such private efforts include the Christian peacemaker teams who stand between Israeli tanks and Palestinian stone throwers, or Witness for Peace who accompany refugees through war zones in Central America, or the Nonviolent Peace Force and their work in Sri Lanka. All of these are hopeful, if risky and demanding, new fields for experimentation, according to Myers and Enns. Finally, the fourth option, if there is non-cooperation on both sides, and no third party capable of intervening to keep the peace, <coughs> then we must turn to nonviolent struggle. This is peace waging. In this case, to make peace, first the existing social order must be disturbed. Those who are comfortable must be awakened to see that there is great injustice still remaining in our world. While tremendous strides have been made in promoting justice, we still have a very long way to go. Enns and Myers say, in order for peacemakers to transform conflict or heal the wounds of violation, they must first disturb the peace of an economic and political system in which power is radically disparate and violence is a tool of social control. We must remain firm in our commitment to nonviolence as we shake up the existing social order. Peace wagers follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, Mahatma Gandhi, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., all of whom advocated <coughs> nonviolence. Many effective strategies of nonviolent resistance are open to peace wagers marches, fasts, vigils, blockades, protests, and so on. Many of you here tonight are actively practicing civil disobedience and non-cooperation with unjust laws in order to wage peace right here in Colombia. I firmly believe that for true peace to come about, historic injustices will need to be confronted. Unless we contend with such mighty wrongs as slavery and slaying of the native peoples, we will continue to be plagued with the injustices that create havoc here in our society. Many cities and towns right here in Missouri have 
incidents of violence and degradation in their history, which fester under the surface of civil society like a thorn that causes an infection in the flesh. One by one, we must unlock the power of these incidents by surfacing the truth, by allowing space and time for lamentation and acknowledgement of pain <coughs> on the part of the victims, and then by working toward forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation. This process must begin with the victims who, who are encouraged to dare to speak truth to power. I look forward to getting to know more and more of you over time. And I look forward to finding out the many and various ways in which you all are, in your own individual ways, participating in this full spectrum of peacemaking through building peace, keeping peace, making peace, and waging peace. May God bless you in those efforts.
first the quotation and then some paraphrasing. They were excerpts from an author who was documenting the terror of house-to-house -house war. He goes on to report hundreds of incidents over a several-year period where so many homes and villages and neighborhoods were destroyed by so many, so many men, women, and children killed, so much devastation to infrastructure, agriculture, and the land itself. He detailed from first-hand accounts, from journals, and media stories the horror of war in which everyone became a victim and all of the perpetrators of violence used all types of force and all types of deception with all sorts of motives justified by all kinds of principles but the results were always devastating demoralizing and deteriorating i was overwhelmed when i made my way through this book and the war of which he wrote it was the guerrilla conflict in Missouri from 1856 through 1865, peaking in 1861 through 1864. The book is Inside War, written by Michael Feldman, written in 1989. I could say that we in Missouri are acquainted with the terror of war. It is our landscape. It was our social context. A president of the United States of America once said, another quotation, by reasons of these differences, each will prefer a different way. At once, sincerity is questioned, and motives are assailed. Actual war coming, blood grows hot, and blood is spilled. Thought is forced from old channels into confusion. Deception breathes and thrives. Confidence dies, and universal suspicion reigns. Each man feels an impulse to kill his neighbor, lest he be killed by him. Revenge and retaliation follow, and all this may be among honest men, but this is not all. Every foul bird comes abroad, every dirty reptile rises up. These add crime to confusion, murders to old grudges, and murders for pelf proceed under any cloak that will best cover for their occasion, unquote. You want to guess that president? These words were written by Abraham Lincoln, written to John M. Schofield, May 27, 1863. Abraham Lincoln was writing about Missouri. To Major General <coughs> Schofield, who had just been appointed commander in St. Louis. The fear that lurks below the surface of so many persons and so many societies can so quickly and easily be manipulated to the surface. And we all become victims of the process of victimizing others. Now what kind of sense is that? Then there is no difference between acts of terror, acts of war, or support for a war that terrorizes. We all are terrorists in that scheme. And what do we do? What might be our response to violence that begets violence? Now, I don't claim to be a pacifist, although I greatly admire those and those of you that are courageous enough to be so. I'm a nonviolent sister, and I would hope to help build cultures of peace around the world. But I, like you, am so frequently tested, pushed, pulled, cajoled, tempted to forget to look for alternatives like you have so graciously shared with us. I forget 
and I just go with the flow. And here I am, matching terror for terror by the support that I give implicitly, if not explicitly. Yet I look for hope. And strange as it may seem, I'm going to turn to Abraham Lincoln again. Near the end of the war, he wrote to then Missouri Governor Thomas C. Fletcher, quote, it seems that there is no organized military force of the enemy in Missouri, and yet that destruction of property and life is rampant everywhere. Is not a cure for this within easy reach of the people themselves? Unquote. Lincoln then called for, as he wrote to the governor of Missouri, he called for town meetings. What a concept. <laughs> he wrote, quote, let neighborhood meetings be everywhere called and hold of all entertaining a sincere purpose for mutual security in the future. Whatever they may be heretofore have thought, said, or done about war or anything else. Let us all meet and waiving all else, pledge ease to cease harassing others. At such meetings, old friendships will cross the memory and Christian charity will come in to help. Now I may take issue with his theology and maybe his policies, all things considered, but maybe Lincoln was tired and internally conflicted, but he still held out hope. He promised hope for unity and good and I offer no less that we use this memorial occasion to work systematically and personally, globally and locally, for every alternative to violent behavior. Let there be no more victims of this act or that war. No war, no act of terror, no violent behavior has ever ended the human propensity to violence. The proof is all around us. The proof is what I read about Missouri. The proof is the memorial that we will be sharing in under later. So why not try something different? What's that old saying about being crazy? <laughs> Same thing, expect different results. We're not going to get peaceful results from violent action. Let's be rational. <laughs> And we are acting in our own self-interest. I don't need new enemies. <laughs> I don't need more resources wasted in the never-ending cycle of war. I don't need any more lives given in vain. One candle, one vote, one act of kindness is sometimes that which keeps us from completely going crazy with vengeful, hateful, destructive behavior. Light a candle tonight. Take another deep breath. Think one more thought of peace. Get one more measure of passion for the next day. Make at least yourself one less victim, and tomorrow, no more victims. Thank you. I want to thank both of our speakers who shared such inspiring and thoughtful, well-researched and presented information. I want to mention that our friend Joshua Holly has been recording this. And I think at some point, uh, if anybody is interested in getting a recording of it, we might be able to facilitate that in a piece note because there's some really important things said here tonight that you might want to share with others who are able to be here. Most cultures have uh, a greeting that's uh, Shalom Aleichem, Salam Aleichem. They say, peace be to you. Um, we say hello. But we can say peace be to you. Would you
Peace to us, peace be to you, peace be to me, peace be to all, and the world be free.